that evil is simply a distortion of what's good. Adam and Eve ate of that tree, if you will, the good things God created began to be distorted and sin entered our land. God doesn't destroy evil because if he did, he would have to destroy you and I. Every, every year or so, my, my brothers and I, at least for the last probably 10 years, maybe more than that, maybe 12, we'd get together to go camping, and we'd meet together, and if I could stay awake, which is tough for me, right around 10.30, right around 10.30 or so, you know, maybe the s'mores would come out, you know? How many of you guys like s'mores? Yeah. yeah. We actually were looking to buy some for you, but we couldn't find them. Just FYI. So the s'mores will kind of come out at about 10.30 or so. But I have found out that the conversation also starts about 10.30. You know what I'm saying? I mean, the deep stuff. Am I right? Around 10.30 or so, like even the men's, when the men's get together for the retreat, if I can stay awake. Or not get sick. Right around 10.30 or so, that's when real conversation happens. Like some deep stuff kind of starts taking place. And so, so we kind of tiled the next three weeks more than s'mores. Because campfires are about more than s'mores. Often in a campfire, there's some really, some kind of some really deep thoughts, some deep questions that go around. And so we're going to take a few weeks and just kind of answer, you know, some of those deep questions of life. The first question that we're going to kind of deal with today is, and I think we all face it, is essentially, why is there so much evil? Have you ever been asked that before? You know, why does God allow so much evil? And, and the phrase is something like, you know, if God is good and God is loving, then how could a good, loving God allow evil to exist? And it seems like a good question, and we're going to deal with that in a little bit. But when it comes to evil, really, I look at kind of evil three different ways. The first, the first way I look at evil is what I, what I would call just kind of a, um, maybe information. You're sitting watching the news or you're on your computer or something and you see like Ebola. That's terrible. I mean, you see it and it's information. Or maybe you know somebody that's going through a very difficult time and you know of them and and, you know, maybe they're struggling or they lost someone to death or whatever it is. And it's, or it's information level. And I think at an information level, when it comes to evil, what they need to hear is, you know what, man, God is faithful. God, God will get you through this thing. I know it seems hopeless, but just hold on. God, you know, God is good. He is. What they don't need to hear at that point is an intellectual argument about the nature of evil. Would you agree? The second way I think evil hits us is I just call it the eye level. The eye level is evil hits me. It's my heart or, you know, my family. I, I lose a child to death or somebody dies or someone gets hurt or a tsunami comes in or a tornado or something happens and it destroys my life. And what I need to hear at that time is you know what, I need to hear God speaking to me saying, hey, Jason, I haven't left you and I haven't abandoned you. I need to hear God speaking to me saying that he still has my back and although the world seems like it's totally out of control, I need to hear God just tell me that although I don't understand the mess that I'm in, that somehow he'll turn it around and it'll, make, it'll be good. I don't have to make sense of it. I just have to know that he still has my back. Are you with me? The third, the third level, if you will, of evil that I think what evil is, I would just call it kind of the intellectual level. The intellectual of evil is at some point you do have to, you do have to work through it mentally. You have to work through the issue of how can a good, all-loving God who's all-powerful allow evil? And I think at some point we do have to work through that because, if you will, that really is the atheist's only proof of why they're an atheist is 
how could a good God let that happen? And I can't believe in a God like that. And so this morning, while the first two are really important, I really want to focus on the, in, in the intellectual level of evil. Because I want to process through it. You know, the Bible says this, hey, always be prepared to give an answer or a defense for why you believe what you believe. And that's what we want to do this morning. So this is probably not going to be, this is probably not going to be one of those sermons that you write home about, you know? Oh, man, Pastor Jason, he did a good job today. Woo, you know? Probably not going to happen. But I hope that when we get done in about 30 minutes, that at a minimum, maybe we understand a little bit about evil, our hearts are changed, and hopefully we're able to minister to somebody else that kind of has the questions, how could God let that happen? Fair enough? I'm going to go ahead and look in Genesis and then look in Corinthians a little bit later. When we look at evil... Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. You've been hanging out in Genesis a lot, haven't we? Genesis 1, chapter 31. Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. <laughs> so God creates, God creates the heaven and the earth. He creates everything around. And he gets done on the sixth day. And here's what he says in verse 31. God took a look at all that he made, and it was good. That's not what it says. Here's what it says. God looked around. God saw all that he made, and it was very good. Did you know that word very isn't even necessary? The word good implies that it's good. So God, you know, the author wants us to know that when God got done, it was very good. No evil. There wasn't a thing that was created that wasn't good. He looked over everything that was done, and it was very good. So where does evil come from? How does that, because certainly evil isn't good, right? And here's the deal. Recognizing that, that it's not good versus evil, and that's a dualistic view. You know, sometimes the Mormons kind of hold this view of that as two opposing forces, and whichever force, you know, wins at the end is kind of the winner. I mean, so it's not good versus evil, but the reality is that evil is simply a distortion of what's good. It's a tweaking it. It's taking the good things that God has given to us, the very good things that God has given to us, and it tweaks it. For example, if you, if you live in the Upper Peninsula for any amount of time, and you buy a, a vehicle, a car. Unless you spend a lot of money maintaining that vehicle, something happens over time. Right? It's kind of brown. It's not a pretty color. We call it rust. Rust, rust in itself is not its own entity. Like you can't go to Kmart and buy a six pack of rust. Rust, rust is only effective as it takes the metal that's on your card and it tweaks it or it twists it or it distorts it so that what was originally there is no longer seen as there. It just kind of ruins it. That's what evil is. Evil is a distortion, a tweaking, a coercion, a lack of the very good things that God has given us in life. That's what evil is. For example, sex is really good. If you're married, yeah, amen. We only heard one. Wow. Just, <laughs> need to do some counseling sessions. Anyway, it's really good if you're married. The problem is, is that we often distort it. If you take sex, and let's just be honest, I think America bows down at the idol of sexuality. If you don't believe me, turn on TV for two seconds. Look on the internet. We bow down at the altar of sexuality. We do. It sells. So you take sexuality, you take that and you, and you put it in a situation where someone's not married and God says, listen, I designed sex 
sex for relationship when you're married because within that connection of a married relationship there's a good and a good and it's very very good and it's healthy and you trust each other and it forms bonds you take that sexuality and you change it and you move it into two people that are not married how many know it destroys it's evil it is trust god on it not me i mean it's what he says not me same thing with pornography right Pornography is simply a distortion, a tweaking, a coercion of the good thing God made it. And we start getting selfish and thinking, okay, I have to look at that or whatever it is. But the reality is God gave you somebody, if you're married, that's the person you're supposed to wait for. That's the person you're supposed to view. And if you're not married, wait until you get married. That's the way God did it. I mean, keep going through this deal. Rape. Rape is a selfish act. It's a twisting of something that God made very good. Incest, sex trafficking, prostitution, all with terrible consequences, all taking something God made good and making it evil, twisting it. I mean, you could go on this on and on. Let me give you another one. Righteous anger. How many know that there's some things in life that we should be angry about? Amen. Right? There's some stuff in life that, dang it, I, I have a right to be angry, and I'm going to fight for it. I'm going to fight for justice. I'm going to fight for truth. I'm going to fight for people that are getting abused. I'm going to fight for that, and I will be angry for it righteously. Jesus was. He went into the temple. He saw the, 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 the merchants selling stuff, and he threw the tables over. Woo, it's like to be there, and said, hey, you will not make my house into a den of thieves. Righteous anger. You take anger, and you twist it, and you turk it, and you coerce it, and all of a sudden, what do you have? You have, like, abuse. Right? You have stuff like uh, uh, killing, revenge, murder. I mean, so you twist it. Let me give you the last one. The last one, and then you can think about a bunch in your own time. Write them down. You have notes, right? Words are really good. I mean, I, listen, I love when people encourage me. Anybody else? I mean, I do. I, you know, maybe it's one of my love languages, but when someone says to me, hey, man, I really appreciate you. I appreciate you spending time. And whatever it is, it just makes me feel good inside. Eh. Anybody else that's kind of your language? Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate you. Everyone that raised your hand, I just want you to know that. But here's the deal. You take words, and if you twist them, you put selfishness on them, all of a sudden you have what? Slander, deceit, gossip, all evil. Just taking good words that God wants you to use and twisting them. Bullying, Right? How many, how many know that there's words that were said to you when you were just a little tyke, maybe a teenager, that today you still deal with because someone said something to you? Raise your hand. Seriously, raise your hand if that's you. Keep it high. Teenagers, look around because this is me too. I meant the words that people say impact for life. You could go on. So the next question is, okay, Okay, I get that. So, but isn't Satan, isn't Satan evil? Yes and no. Satan is the father of lies. But this, this is going to blow your mind. So just hold on. In the beginning, when God created the devil, God created it, him good. Do you get that? I mean, as far as we know, we don't know it's absolutely true, but as far as we know, most people believe that Satan was the lead musician or the worship leader for the hosts of heaven. That's what, we don't know if it's true or not. It's just what, what we believe to be the case. Whoa, you've got to be really good, dude. I mean, that's some, right? So is Satan evil? Satan's evil because he has been really good at twisting the good things that God has given to him, like an intellect and creativity, and twisting it and using it for evil. So he's not his own separate deal. I mean, listen, Satan, man, Satan's hands are locked. He can create nothing new. He can only take what God has already made and twist it and tweak it and move it and change it. And all he can't recreate anything fresh. No, it's all God's good stuff just tweaked and tormented and twisted so that it has an evil purpose or ill intent. By the way, this is one reason I, I really believe that the Bible says, well, I know it says this, that that every day God creates is a good day. Right? Every day is a good day. Some people say, Pastor Jason, why, 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 why do you do a, a fall uh, festival, a fall carnival? Don't you know that's Satan's day? Why would you do that? Here's my answer. It's 
It's not Satan's day. It's God's day. And if on October 31st, Satan tries to take one of God's good days and put his stamp on it, uh uh-uh. Nope. You can say anything you want to about it. It's always God's day. And as a church, we'll say, you know what? We're going to invite the community here, and we're going to love on them, and we're going to encourage them. And the day that Satan meant for evil, we're going to put some Jesus on it and turn it for the good. That's what we're going to do. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. So that's why we do it. And by the way, there were such big crowds this year. We have to tweak it a little bit and try it different, just so you know, so don't get upset. Every kid gets a track. We may not be able to do the large environment, but every kid's going to get a track. We're going to love on them. So if you're able to be here just to love on kids in our community, would you do that? Yeah? Amen? Okay, I'll go on. If evil's a distortion or the absence of good, where did evil in the world come from? And I think most of us, I mean, we kind of get this. I'm going back to Genesis again. Genesis chapter 2, verse 9, maybe verse 8. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for, the, good for food. And I love this. I love that, that we put that in there. God cares about aesthetics, you know, because pleasing to the eye, it looked good and it tasted good. So God says, hey, anything you want. Eat whatever you want. Enjoy it. It looks great. It tastes great. Enjoy it. But one, right? Just one tree, dude. Just one. Can't you just hold yourself for one, you know? One tree. Just don't eat. Or two, you know, tree of good and evil, tree of life. Don't, don't, do, don't do it. How many of you wish you were there? No, Adam. No, no, Adam. No, no. Don't do it. Verse 16. God said you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat it, you will surely die. When Adam and Eve ate of that tree, if you will, the good things God created began to be distorted, and sin entered our land, and we will never be the same again. Where does evil come from? It comes from right there. I meant the thistle started growing and things started changing and, and, and all of a sudden Adam and Eve became count, uh, conscious of, of, you know, of themselves and uh, in the loss of innocence, decay and disease and sickness and messed up DNA and chromosomes and natural disasters. You know, I love rain. I don't like floods. You know, I like wind. I don't like tornadoes, right? And so all this stuff happened. Evil happens because of the fall. By definition... Evil entered our world. And then this is what's crazy. It didn't stop there. Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all have sinned. Where, did, where, where does evil come from? It came from Adam and Eve. But what's really crazy is it comes from us. I mean, hold on to that for a moment. Write that in your notes. Where does evil come from? We bring it. Because you're going to need to hear this in a moment because it's going to come back to it. We, we bring evil. We distort God's truth. We distort the good things God had. We tweak it. We do our own way. We bring it. True? Every time we choose something other than God's will, we bring more death and decay to our world. And the sad part is it's still killing and destroying. James 1.15. Each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust, his or her own, own desire. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. When sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. You know, it's so crazy. God leads us and says, listen, just trust me on this thing. I'm telling you, if you do what's right, it'll be good for you. But if you don't do what's right, it's going to destroy your life. And how many times do we say... We just kind of play with sin, you know, like it's a yo-yo or something, like it's a toy. But the reality is that sin will always kill, it will always destroy, it will always distort what God has for us. If God is not the author of evil, why did God allow Adam to bring evil into the world in the first place? Now here's the deal. If God 
is all known, which the Bible says that he is. Why, why, did, why did he allow it? I mean, he knew that Adam would, would fall, right? That's what the Bible says. I mean, why did he allow it? Why, why did he bring it in? I think the first answer is this. God could have not created at all. If God's not the author of evil, why did God allow Adam to bring evil into the world? You know what? He could have prevented it by not creating at all. Just stopped it. You know, hey, no Adam, no fall. I mean, the crazy thing is this, is that it talks about Jesus as being predestined to be a sacrifice. In other words, God knew that Adam would fall. And in knowing, he still created him. Remember last, and this is what's crazy about it. Last, last week, we had that, you know, Abraham sacrifice it was Isaac, and then God spared Isaac. The crazy thing is God knowingly creating Adam, knowing he wouldn't be able to spare his own son, Jesus Christ, but instead would give him as an offering for all of us. Isn't that just insane? So God could have said, okay, I just won't create. But here's what I believe. A less than perfect world is better than a non-world any day. Would you agree? I mean, I'm so thankful that God gave me life. I'm so thankful that it, for some reason he said, I'm, the fire is getting me hot up here. <laughs> I'm so thankful that for some reason he said, you know what, I want Jason Janish to be in this world. And there's times that are really tough for me and times that I wish he wouldn't have said it, but the reality is, is I am thankful that he chose to have me created, he chose to have me born. And, I, and I, you know, here's what one uh, uh, poet kind of said this, it is better to have loved and to have lost than to have never have loved at all. Right? So it's better to have lived life, even though there's evils in it, than to never have lived at all. I just believe that's the case. So certainly that wasn't uh, an option at all. That would be like saying, you know what? Some people, you know, when they walk, they break their legs so no one can walk anymore. Or some people uh, are cruel to their children so no one can have children. I mean, to get rid of all of creation because Adam and fall would fall um, doesn't make sense. God could have created a non-moral world where sin could not occur. In other words, hey, the definition of love is you have to give free will, right? I mean, you, I, can't, I can't make you love me and then say, oh, look, she loves me. Because that's, are you with me? It's not love. I mean, love, you have, in order to love somebody, you have to be able to not love them. In order to serve somebody if you will to not serve them. There has to be that free will deal. And so God could have said, you know what? I'm going to create robots and they won't have a choice. It'll just be, we love you, God. We love you, God. We love you, God. But that's not love. That's just robot. So certainly God didn't do that. He allowed us to have free will. The problem with free will is that you get to choose the good or the bad. Moral freedom means that if we choose to be selfish or dishonest, we can be selfish or dishonest, and God won't stop because then that stops the consequences for free will, the fruit of it. Let me, let me go to the third one. God could have, God could have created us like angels. I mean, think about it. He could have said, okay, hey, Al, create. Ronnie, create. Boom. Right? I mean, he could have did that. And then, I mean, but you still could have I mean, sinned, but then at least if, if Al sinned, and then Ronnie would be okay. Well, we kind of have that. We call them angels. And guess what? A third of the host of heaven fell. And so God already had angels, so he didn't want more angels. He wanted people that could freely choose. He wanted people that could, you know, get married and have kids and have unity and have a family and, and heredity. I mean, those are exciting things about life, aren't they? So let me get down to really, I think, is the big question. Why doesn't God just destroy evil? Why doesn't he just destroy it? I mean, certainly he can. Remember what I said a couple points ago? God doesn't destroy evil because... If he did, he would have to destroy you and I. Have you ever done something evil? Have you ever distorted the good things that God has called you to do 
and did something with a selfish motive. If God destroys evil, he destroys you. I mean, that's hard to grasp, I think, sometimes. It's hard to rest with, but, but that really is the reality. Let me turn to 2 Peter. 2 Peter uh, 3.9. Paul is talking, wait, 2 Peter 3, 9, where are they at? Da, 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 da. Pat, 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Listen, it's the, this is going to sound crazy, but it's the love of God. It's God's infinite love that allows evil to continue, even though sometimes people get hurt through it. I mean, this, I think this is really the question with evil. This is where it gets hard, is that sometimes, man, my decisions affect people around me. And, and, and listen, when I was in Illinois, there was a car that I wanted to buy. It was a, um, I can't think of the name of it. Ah, but it was a car. It was. Subaru. It was a Subaru. Subaru Outback. Sweet, it was a great deal. And so we drove to Illinois. I brought my kids with me, my wife, and we drove to, rather to Champaign or Bannon when we lived in Illinois, about an hour's drive from my home. And I check out the Subaru station wagon, and it was a good deal. And so, like, I started it, and everything looked fine. I paid the guy the money, and I thought, man, in celebration of getting a great deal, let's go to Culver's, right? So I drive about, oh, hmm three, four minutes or so, and all of a sudden, my heat gauge is like a tack. Whoot, 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 whoot. And I think, oh no, my heat gauge is broke. So I pull over, you know, like my dad taught me to do, and I looked at, I popped up on the hood, and inside the hood was this green stuff all over. Yeah. I wish it was just a heat gauge. It was either a blown head gasket or, or a, you know, a cracked head or something, but it was not good. Here's the, here's the deal. At that moment, when I just wasted like 2,500 bucks, God did not step in and say, okay, Jason's kids, listen, your dad just spent part of your money. You guys are going to have to suffer because it's going to have to get fixed. So I'm going to step in and I'm going to write each one of you a check. Right? God, did, God didn't do that for my kids. Has God done that for anybody? When we make mistakes, yeah, God just kind of intervenes. Same thing with my wife. I mean, sometimes I'm a jerk. Thank you for not saying amen. So sometimes, <laughs> sometimes I am. And sometimes I say things to my wife that I shouldn't say. And God doesn't step in and say, Jason, goodbye. And I'm dead. He doesn't. I mean, for some reason, he allows the evil to happen. My wife still gets scarred. But, but you do the same thing. S sometimes, sometimes things cost others. And I think this is where evil is so hard for us to handle. And we forget the fact that it's God's love, God's patience that allows evil to happen. It's God's patience that says, you know what? Man, I'm just, I have to let it happen because that's free will. It wouldn't, you know, if I told Strider, hey, listen, Strider, you can either do homework or you can go to your friend's house. Which one do you want to do? And he says, I want to go to my friend's house. And, and then I say, wait, wait, stop, stop, stop. Okay. Let me give you a choice again. You can either do your homework or go to your friend's house. Um, but you're doing homework. That's not really a choice, right? If I say to him, Strider, you can go to homework, or you can go to your friend's house, and he says, I'm going to go to my friend's house, and then while he's at his friend's house, I do his homework. <laughs> it's really not even free choice, because it's, it's not, right? right? And I think we have to understand that it's God's love that allows us, if you will, as twisted as it might time seem in our finite minds, it's God's love that allows us to reap the consequences of our bad behavior. And often, those consequences even come from other people's bad behavior. Uh, my, my, brother, my brother's girlfriend, ex-girlfriend, she had a child with another boyfriend. It's complicated. 
But she had a child with this other guy before she met my brother. And the child may have been, oh, about a year old, just the cutest girl, you know. And the child started crying and screaming. You know how kids do that, right? And he picked up the child. Stop screaming. Stop it. Stop it. The child is 12 years old today, maybe 13, is in a wheelchair and totally unable to comprehend anything. Shaken baby syndrome. I mean, so sometimes within God's grace, not understanding it, sometimes he allows us to reap the consequences of our behavior. Let me continue on. Sometimes, sometimes somebody gets pregnant before they should get pregnant. And they have a baby before they're able to have a baby, before they should be able to have a baby. Are you with me? And then as the time goes on, sometimes those kids don't turn out quite like they should. But God allows it anyway. Or sometimes there's a, a, a person that's hooked on drugs and has a kid and the kid is addicted to drugs as, as an infant. But this is what's even more crazy that often the people that are on drugs, help me somebody, often people that are on drugs are on drugs because they're trying to cover their own hurt. Is that true? Yeah. And so there's this cycle of God's infinite love and infinite wisdom that we can't comprehend. But he says, listen, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will always have your back. Sometimes I'll intervene supernaturally and pull this thing back together. But often God just allows life to happen in that context. But he's still biased the whole time with this. And I believe that he's grieving often. Are you with me? The fact is that he's an infinite God and we are finite. And sometimes he's just hard to understand. But I know this, to dis destroy evil, God would have to destroy you and me. And I'm thankful that he doesn't. Amen. I'm going to ask the worship team if they would come up this morning. Second Corinthians chapter 4. Paul deals with this issue of, of how God is been with them and, and blessed them and then he just kind of he just kind of says this I don't know maybe the story of all of our lives in different ways and he, let me just read it for you 2 Corinthians 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 8 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 8 yeah, actually I start at verse 7 we have this treasure in jars of clay so this this anointing God gave to him, this responsibility, in this frail jar that is easily breakable, that is just fragile. So we have this treasure, this great, this great responsibility, this, all this stuff in this little frail jar. To show that this all-surpassing power is from God, not from us. But then listen as he goes on. Verse 8. We are hard-pressed on every side, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed but we are not in despair. We are persecuted, some, you know, beaten and whipped, and we are persecuted, but we are not abandoned. We are struck down, but we are not destroyed. We always carry around in our own body the death of Jesus, literally, repeatedly getting beat, getting abused for the sake of Christ so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Man. They got it. Didn't they? They may take my life, but never take my spirit. You can take everything you want in this world, but I'll always have God on my side. Difficult question, isn't it? It is. Stand with me this morning. Please. Father, I thank you this morning for your faithfulness in our lives. I thank you that, God, just to be honest, I'm, I'm thankful that you never killed me. Because, <laughs> Lord, I really deserved it a lot of times. Lord, if you were to destroy evil, I, I'm convinced I'd be the first one on your list. 
And so God, I, in light of that, I pray that you help me to be patient when other people are evil towards me. Help me to be as patient with them as you are. And in your love, not wanting anyone to perish. And Lord, I also pray that when evil touches those around me, whether it be through natural disaster, whether it be through just messed up DNA, or God, help me to be you to their lives. Help me to love on them and to encourage them, God, to invest in them, not just to shut an eye or shut an ear to. And I think of certain of the people in Africa with Ebola. Lord, let, it, let us not be said that we just passed by. But God, let us pray and intercede and ask you to spare them and to touch them. Lord, I pray for anyone in this room that maybe has been affected. I pray that your grace would be shown so strong uh, in their lives that they would sense your hand. They would sense your grace. They would sense that you're in control. God, empower us this week now as we go out. Lord, give us a hunger for you or we need thirst for you. Lord, give us opportunities to love on people, to encourage them in Jesus' name. God, let us be light and salt in this community. In your name, everyone said, amen. 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 Altars are always open. We mentioned that last week. If you would like someone to pray with you, if a couple, don't need all, but a couple of the board people and their spouses are here. That would help us a little bit, but you guys have a great week. God is good. Amen.